when I interviewed parents for my book, it was almost like they couldn't let go, that the parents said that um, they didn't know how to stop guiding them. Um, and it was, it was a sincere feeling, I think, but, but it's a problem because um, as they get into college and the workplace, this generation needs, obviously, to become more independent, and certainly professors and employers don't want to hear from parents. Um, so um, when, I, when I was looking at some uh, <clears throat> colleges and how they were dealing with this issue, it seemed like at orientation more and more, the president of the college was including in her, his or her message that now's the time to start letting go. It was sort of a subtle message, but it was very clear that the colleges are trying to get parents to uh, realize that now at 18 is the time to let them make their decisions on their own. Um, at one college in New Jersey, Seton Hall University, at the orientation there, they actually have the parents and the kids make teddy bears together, sort of like a Build-A-Bear workshop in format. And uh, it's sort of to let the parents take the teddy bear home in place of the child, and hopefully that will help them break the bond. Uh, the woman who runs her orientation, her line is that now it's time to be a coach and not a cruise director, not quite as involved. Um, and she always closes by saying, see you at graduation. Of course, that's wishful thinking because parents do not go away at, uh, at when they leave their kids off at college. Um, I think that's one issue, but I think what's the most troubling, um, both from the standpoint of the millennials themselves and from the employer's perspective, is how active parents have become in the job search and even after um, a, a child has taken a job. Um, I heard repeatedly from companies that parents wanted to come for the job interview. In fact, one company in the transportation business said the parents not only asked to come for the job interview with their child, but they wanted the company to pay their travel expenses to get to the interview. Um, and then after they're in the job, um, some managers say they'll hear from parents when uh, their child doesn't get a glowing performance review. Um, and so companies are taking different approaches to that. Most are drawing the line and saying, no way, you're not coming to the job interview, you're not gonna get involved in the performance review. Um, but some are still involving parents. Um, one of the big accounting firms, they give out a flash drive that has all the information about benefits and other things at the company. And they say, give this to your parents. It'll answer a lot of their questions. So they know parents are gonna be involved. Um, some companies uh, have parent days at the office where parents are actually allowed to come spend the day at the office and see what it's really like for their child to work there. Now those seem relatively harmless, um, but, um, but clearly uh, there does need to be a line drawn here. Um, of all the attributes I guess I came across of this generation, I think the one that probably defines the millennial generation more than any other is the fact that they really have great expectations. Um, uh, some call it entitlement, um, who are more critical of them, but I say great expectations. They really want to do well, but they also have a lot of expectations from employers. Um, they, they want to have meaningful work as soon as possible. They don't want to have to do pay their dues, as some generations would, would say. Um, and that causes some of the tension that arises between millennials and Gen Xers and baby boomers. Um, I, I interviewed one young man who said he believes that um, there should be true meritocracies in companies, meaning that you advance as fast as your skills and experiences allow you to. You know, you do really well. You don't have to wait 10 years to become a managing director at an investment bank. So that's really what the millennials want. They want to move ahead fast. They want to achieve. Uh, and they don't want to uh, have to do what they consider mundane work. Um, one thing that some companies find uh, irritating about millennials is the fact that they don't seem to have boundaries. Um, uh, several recruiters I interviewed for my book talked about student stalkers. And these are young people who they find, they'll email all the way up to the CEO to try to get a job at the company. They don't have these boundaries where they limit their contact to the HR person or the college recruiter. And um, they find that offensive. Um, I interviewed the head of a PR agency in Manhattan who said some of the young women who work for her get overly friendly. They put their, ar they put their arms around her, hug her, 
And she says, they treat me like I'm their girlfriend, but I'm their boss, and I don't like that. So, so these are some of the issues that, um, that companies are finding with this generation. Um, another thing is that millennials want a lot of feedback. They want a lot of praise. Um, forget the annual performance review. That's not nearly enough. Uh, millennials would like to hear from their boss at least once a week, if possible, to give them an update. How am I doing? I heard this so many times uh, from young people that they really need this reinforcement. It doesn't all have to be positive. Of course, they'd like it to be that, but they just want to know that they're, they're, they're moving ahead. Again, this desire to move quickly, this impatience. Um, I interviewed a French professor at Dartmouth College who told me that she was known as a tough grader there. And so finally, one student came in and said, you know, you don't tell us enough good things about our papers and our work. So she handed her a smiley face stamp, and she said, I really think you should use this on our papers. Uh, it'd make us feel a lot better. <laughs> so I think, again, this comes a lot from the way parents and teachers uh, at an early age had somewhat coddled these, pe these young people. And um, the fact that, as I call them, trophy kids, they often did get a trophy for just sitting on the bench. Didn't matter if they ever hit a home run, they still got that trophy. So they want a lot of positive feedback, even if they're not doing exceptional work. Um, they also need a lot of detailed directions and guidance. Um, I interviewed someone at a pharmaceutical company who said a young man was late turning in a project and he asked him, why was it late? And he said, but you forgot to remind me. So, I mean, this is like, to this manager, this was bizarre that this young person expected to be reminded of a deadline. Um, and I think that through the years, again, because parents have been so involved in their lives, because schools often give very detailed uh, guidelines for how to do projects and that sort of thing, that the generation likes checklists. They really need a lot of hand-holding along the way. Um, I interviewed the career services director at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, and she was saying how she has a checklist on the website for how to go about getting ready for your job interviews, and yet she still gets calls at dinner time from young people asking her one question or another, how to resolve a conflict with two interviews at the same time. So um, I think that's one of the biggest issues, perhaps, uh, in terms of companies having to deal with uh, spending a lot of time giving direction to young people and perhaps finding that they don't deal well with ambiguity or situations where the answer isn't so clear cut. Um, and uh, some people think this is perhaps because millennials were, had spent so much time on teams in schools and colleges and they've come to want a group consensus. They like collaboration, which is great, but uh, perhaps there's a little too much team mentality in this generation. Um, as I said earlier, uh, pr probably one of the greatest traits of the generation from an employer standpoint is their multitasking ability. Um, I interviewed a young woman at IBM who said, frankly, it's hard to imagine not doing a million things at once. And the Kaiser Foundation did a study where they found that a third of 8 to 18-year-olds multitask while they're doing their homework, listen to music, play video games, um, text message, whatever, all while they're trying to do their homework which causes some people to question whether this is the attention deficit disorder generation. Uh, are they not gonna be focused enough on any one thing when they do have one of these big ambiguous problems to resolve? Now some companies are um, realizing that the generation does um, want to be connected technologically and to uh, have things like social networks within the company, wikis and blogs. Um, in order to do their multitasking and to stay connected. I think that um, I found myself when I was doing my book that um, this generation um, is very different in terms of how it communicates than baby boomers firsthand. When I wanted to reach a young woman who had worked at FedEx as a summer intern, they gave me her email address and I emailed her and said, can I do an interview with you? and I didn't hear from her for several weeks. So the company said, did you ever do the interview? And I said, well, no, I didn't hear from her. And so they went on Facebook, and she was on the phone with me in 30 minutes. Um, 
obviously, you know, email is a dinosaur to many in this generation. And that's one of the reasons, among others, that I think there is somewhat of a communications gap between the millennials and the older generations. Um, the, using text shortcut words and formal writing is an issue. Um, and um, I think some people worry that because there's so much texting and so much other electronic communication through social networking sites, that some of this generation is missing out on developing important interpersonal skills. Um, I had a number of people tell me that their children or their employees will text them even when they're only 15 feet away rather than talk to them. And um, I think that's not necessarily the best thing because you're missing that opportunity to learn to listen well, to read people's faces, body language, and just to speak articulately. Um, and I, th I believe that that, that's one concern that, um, that all this electronic communication has raised with some employers and professors. Now, of all the things millennials want in the workplace, um, I believe flexibility is surely the number one thing. While all generations have asked for more work-life balance, I think the millennials will demand it, and I think they'll probably get it uh, to a large degree. Um, I heard repeatedly from people I interviewed in this generation that to them, work isn't a place you go to, it's what you do, meaning the attitude is, I can do my work anywhere, anytime. As long as I get it done, produce results, that's all that should matter. And some companies have, have bought that argument. Um, Best Buy has a program called Results Only Work Environment, where some of their employees um, are allowed to work totally on their own time, um, come into the office when they need to work at home when they want to um, go exercise in the afternoon, but be online at midnight, at home, whatever, uh, as long as they produce the results. And seemingly, it's working relatively well there. Um, besides wanting flexibility, I found this generation really likes a casual atmosphere, sort of like you guys here at Google have, I think, to a large degree. Um, but not every company is suited to that. Um, uh, I was surprised when I interviewed someone at Capital One Financial. They said they actually do allow employees to wear shorts uh, if they aren't going to be interacting face-to-face -face with customers or, or suppliers. Um, and the U.S. Army actually had to change its tattoo policy to try to keep attracting recruits from this generation, allowing tattoos in certain body parts that they wouldn't have in the past. And uh, I interviewed one young woman at an investment bank who said, if she could only wear blue jeans to work every day, she'd pay $20 a day. So I think this casualness really does matter a lot, and more companies are realizing that they need to think about ways they can um, provide this. Um, the one thing a lot of managers found really irritating when I interviewed them were the iPods, the ubiquitous iPods. They couldn't stand it when they saw people with iPods plugged into their ears while they were working. It was like to them, it, they just couldn't be concentrating. They couldn't be doing good work. Uh, finally, I did find a woman at one ad agency in New York who said, actually, I thought it was terrible when I first saw it, but the work they turned in was fine. So she was a convert. But most, most companies um, seem to have this real aversion to iPods in the workplace. I think the most admirable characteristic of the millennial generation is their altruism. Um, I almost, I'd say every millennial I interviewed for the book talked about wanting to make the world a better place or to give back in some way. And um, one young woman I interviewed said she had been at an investment bank and she just felt like her life didn't have the meaning she was seeking. That all she was doing was making rich people richer. So she went back to business school um, and now is working at a public utility in renewable energy. Um, business schools clearly have recognized this desire and are adding more and more courses that deal with social and environmental responsibility. Um, the most recent study found two-thirds of business schools have some sort of course like this as a requirement compared to one-third in 2001. Um, some young people talk about being social entrepreneurs, and a lot of them would like to work for Teach for America. Uh, some companies recognizing this are offering more community service opportunities on the job, whether it's a sabbatical or just a 
day of volunteer work a year to try to appeal to this need to, uh, to be altruistic. Some of the cynical people I interviewed for my book said they wondered, though, if this was just a passing fad. In other words, sort of like the baby boomers who were very socially active in college, would this pass once they got into the reality of the workplace, had mortgages and families to support? And I could see the point they were making, but I have to say, when I interviewed young people, this seemed like such an ingrained, such a passionate desire that I don't think it will ever totally go away, and I hope it does, and I think it's really, um, really one of the greatest uh, traits of the millennials. And what kind of jobs do millennials want? Well, as you see, your own companies uh, listed here. Certainly Google is one of the dream jobs for many millennials, both undergraduates and business school students. Um, now, while millennials do want to have this flexible work life, I was surprised that so many of them still are interested in careers in consulting, banking, accounting, where the hours can be quite long. Um, like obviously, there is still a desire to make money and be successful in that regard. Um, again, reflecting this altruism, um, a lot more millennials are talking about working for nonprofits and government agencies than other generations did when asked where they wanted to go after college. Um, I think this generation has a good, strong entrepreneurial streak. Um, it, it would allow them to be in charge, uh, to have the flexibility that they want. And finally, um, uh, I'm sure that uh, they really want to work for a company that has a good corporate reputation. Um, I've written a lot about corporate reputation um, through the years, and um, studies of this generation show that virtually all of them value that, that they want a company that um, has a good reputation for being ethical uh, and for giving back. Now, this is a list from Universum for this year of the ideal employers for undergraduates in the United States. And your company, Google, is, is number one again this year. Um, in the undergraduate list, you see a fair number of government agencies and some nonprofits, um, along with technology companies like Google, Apple, and Microsoft. Now, when you look at the MBA list, it's somewhat different. Again, you're getting more the consulting firms, uh, some of the banks, um, and, uh, and, and again, the technology companies are there too. Um, but you don't see the nonprofits and government agencies in this list, which I think is interesting. I guess after they spend all that money for their MBA, they can't afford not to <laughs> go with a private company. Now, um, one of the big issues um, <clears throat> that I found as I did my book and talked to companies was the challenge of recruiting millennials. Um, they found that the traditional technique of going to campus, making the big presentation, and just doing the interviews, um, that wasn't working very well. They weren't really um, exciting the millennials. They weren't really even reaching them. Fewer and fewer were showing up for these mass presentations about the company. So more and more companies are realizing that they have to meet millennials online, um, and that means better career websites, more opportunity for instant messaging and texting between <clears throat> the company's HR people and the millennials, and uh, even more social networking um, with millennials. On the websites, um, I think companies are focusing in on some of these traits or desires that I talked about earlier, the career development and mentoring, work-life balance, diversity, and community service. Um, some companies are putting more videos on there with employees talking about uh, their experiences to give more of a feel for what it's really like to work at that company. Um, the only danger here I see is that there could be sort of a look-alike problem as more companies do these video websites uh, with texting opportunities that there's going to be a challenge to stand out in some way to, to get the attention of this generation. And, one way I think some companies are doing it is by going on social networking sites. Uh, Ernst & Young was one of the very first companies to do this. They did it on Facebook. Um, they found it was a great branding tool for recruiting, and, um, and they've been happy with the results. Um, the one danger, and this was something they debated at Ernst & Young, was they're giving up control of the content of their site. Uh, unlike their own websites, they can control everything on it. 
on Facebook, the wall, people make comments and they're all complimentary about the company and accounting. Um, and they say they try to not censor it too much unless there's something offensive on there uh, that could be like a racial slur or something like that. They take those off. But otherwise, they leave pretty much everything there. Now, the U.S. Army has been on MySpace and other sites um, in their quest to attract more recruits. And KPMG um, decided to go on YouTube uh, with their site. Um, they felt it was the most influential site with millennials, and it was a way, again, to break through and be different from other companies. Um, other ways companies are connecting with millennials, um, some companies like Google are partnering with Teach for America and letting new recruits go work for Teach for America for a couple years and then join the company. Um, more and more recruiters were telling me that the competition wasn't just other banks or other consulting firms or other technology companies. Increasingly, their biggest competitor was Teach for America. So they realized better join them, uh, and, and that would be a more successful way to recruit this generation. Some companies say they search blogs, career sites, looking for interesting fits for their company. Um, L'Oreal and a few other companies have these major online game events um, for students, both undergrad and MBA level. Um, and not only is it uh, an interesting uh, experience for the students and uh, sort of fun, but it allows L'Oreal to spot talent in marketing and strategy competitions that they, they sponsor globally. And then finally, uh, this really interested me, was that um, some companies say that they're having to reach out earlier and earlier to younger people, even in middle school, because they're starting to think about careers at a younger age than ever. So companies like Deloitte uh, have developed things like the student journal that they give out in middle and high schools. Um, uh, their goal, obviously, is to spark interest in the accounting profession, but they also have a lot of other information about career planning. Now, this was before the economy and the job market got so bad, but um, when I was writing my book, companies said that even harder than recruiting millennials was retaining them. Um, in the survey we did of recruiters, uh, half the respondents said it's more difficult to retain millennial generation hires. Um, and there really was this tendency to hop from job to job when there were more jobs out there. I, I interviewed a young woman at an accounting firm who said, that she'd been there, I think, three or four years when I interviewed her, but she said when she hit the two-year mark, all her friends said, how can you stay there? You've been there two years. You've got to move on. What's wrong with you? And there was this feeling that um, you weren't developing your career if you stayed too long, um, even if, as in her case, the company pro provided you with different opportunities in different departments of the company. Um, and I heard a lot of stories about people quitting after three months, six months, emailing their resignation in rather than even resigning in person. So it was really an issue for a while there. Now, clearly, that's changed uh, with this economy we're in. Um, one thing, though, companies that deal with this issue said they tried to do is stay in touch with the millennials that leave that they really think are great talents because they know they're not going to necessarily find the grass greener at the other companies they move to. So they call these boomerang recruits, and they found that a, a good technique. Now, um, right now we have four generations in the workplace, not as many of the last generation, the traditionalists, but still a few of them are around at many companies. Um, the three big generations, of course, being now millennials, Gen Xers, and baby boomers. And this uh, table I developed for my book outlines the, some of their traits, some of the historical events that helped shape these generations. Um, I'll go through each generation now, their traits, so you can look at them um, more closely. Um, I've covered all of these for the millennials. Um, and unlike the millennials, Generation X tends to be much more self-reliant, cynical, less trusting of authority, not as friendly with adults, perhaps. Um, still technology savvy, though, and entrepreneurial. Um, the baby boomers, of course, have a workaholic image. Um, they're competitive, loyal, more loyal uh, to their employers. Um, and finally, the traditionalists um, are probably the most different from the millennials in that they 
um, are very they very conservative, respect authority, solid work ethic, and um, really have this strong loyalty to stay with their employer. Um, and if you wonder if there is generational conflict, well, look at these two comments. Um, the first one was an email I received after my article ran about the millennial generation. And the second one was a comment posted on a blog about law firms. Now, most people obviously aren't this extreme, but there clearly are some points of contention um, over what some people perceive as the millennial sense of entitlement, lack of a strong work ethic, and some of these needs they have for feedback, uh, communicating by texting and other ways uh, that boomers and Gen Xers may not like as much, their casual manner. Um, and then on the other side, the older generation's need for FaceTime irritates millennials. Um, some, <clears throat> I think the ultimate irony here, in a way, is that some of these older managers, many of them, in fact, are the, are the parents who raised the millennials to be the way they are, and yet they find them very hard to deal with in the workplace. I think more companies are trying to deal with these generational issues um, with seminars, opening the lines of communications more to uh, avoid some of the misunderstandings and to appreciate the differences. I mean, all the generations have something great to contribute. Um, Obviously, the millennials can teach the older generation something about multitasking and technology, and the older generations as mentors can share their many years of experience and knowledge of a company. Um, this desire to be friends on the part of the millennials could be something that older managers, I think, can use very positively to, as mentors and, and coaches in a way. So, so in conclusion, I found this the millennial generation fascinating. Um, I think they're a complex generation that on the one hand, they tend to be high achievers, but they may lack the necessary leadership skills uh, to an independent thinking that would make them be able to run a company. Um, they want all this flexibility and freedom to work on their own terms, but they also need a lot of feedback and direction. And while they dream of fame and fortune, they also want to get back to society. So to me, some of these seemingly conflicting traits uh, made, made the millennials a great, uh, a great subject for my research and exploration. Now, how to manage the millennials? This is a question many companies ask, uh, ask me about. Um, I mean, it's, to me, it's clearly a balancing act that it's going to take a lot of give and take on the part of all the generations. Um, I think the most important thing in terms of helping millennials uh, adapt to a company is to make them feel important and involved. Um, I think that you have to give them flexible work schedules, but tell them this is only when the work process allows, when business needs allow for this sort of flexibility. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with time for iPods and social networking when it makes sense in the business day. Um, certainly companies have to provide more feedback. Um, but it has to be, again, within reason, not daily or weekly necessarily. And companies, um, I think, need to struggle with helping millennials move from this need for direction and checklist by telling them, why don't you go back and figure it out yourself and then come back. And if you still haven't figured it out, then we'll talk. But try to encourage them to be more independent. Um, and when it comes to parents, um, I think the wise companies are showing respect for parents. As I said, one company gave out benefit and other corporate information to the, to the applicants to give to their parents. Um, that sort of behavior is probably a good thing because it avoids alienating the potential recruit and the parents, um, and yet it clearly keeps some boundaries uh, between the job and the parents. Now, um, the book I wrote was done pretty much before the economy started tanking. Um, I finished it um, <clears throat> early last summer. And um, at that time, um, clearly the millennials were still, you know, there was still this desire to attract a lot of them. This, I don't know if it was a battle for talent so much, but there was a need to try to reach out to millennials and try to meet some of their expectations. Now things have changed a lot. And I think the economy is a big wake-up call for this generation that they aren't going to be able to have it all, probably. And um, 
probably will lower some of their expectations, which isn't a bad thing. Um, certainly there's more boomeranging back home than ever after college because either you can't find a job or the job just doesn't pay enough. Um, I think the one concern might be that there would be fear and insecurity on the part of millennials if this parental safety net weakens because parents lose their jobs as well. Um, certainly there's got to be less job hopping now and unfortunately probably fewer entrepreneurial opportunities because credit and venture capital are less available. Um, I think where nonprofit and government jobs exist, we'll see more and more millennials going that direction. And probably the most positive outcome, I think, of this, um, this recession could be that it will make millennials more resilient and more flexible in their thinking, um, less demanding. But I do think that no matter what uh, the economy, how the economy goes, that it will not change the basic values of this generation, that I think they still will want the work-life balance, they still will want to have a diverse workplace to be part of, and they still want to have meaningful work to do, and as well as want to make the world a better place. So that's a good thing in my mind. I think that uh, these values are really innate in this generation and that, some, that a bad economy alone won't change that. So I'm going to conclude on that note because we're <clears throat> getting close on time. Um, so I just want to thank you again for letting me talk about what I consider a fascinating and a highly influential generation. And I really do welcome any questions, comments that you have about this generation. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so it seems like the populate the economic kind of um, group of people that you were looking at were sort of college educated. That's true. You know, um, uh, you know, very likely to have corporate careers. Can you talk a little bit about the millennial generation that maybe isn't in that same that same stratosphere? Have you have you looked at them at all, or do you have any thoughts about kind of if they share these same attributes? That's a good question. I did point out in my book that the millennials I'm talking about are, for the most part, college educated, the kind of employees that recruiters are actively seeking, basically. And I also pointed out that not every trait certainly applies to every member of this generation. Everybody's an individual. Um, that These are traits that uh, cut across the generation and are common, but not uh, not applicable to every person. But as for people, say, who are high school graduates but don't go on for another, um, I didn't explore it in depth, but I did talk to a few people like that. And I did come away with a sense that their expectations were a little uh, more moderate, that they didn't. Uh, they often came from families where the parents might have had to work two jobs. So I think they had an appreciation for that, that you do have to work hard, and sometimes it's a struggle. Um, that they had less, they were less entitled, if you will, because they had been given less uh, and um, their parents hadn't uh, given them the attention or the material possessions that some, some young people had. Um, but I think that, um, but I also did, I, I did interview an um, a HR person at a railroad company where there would be more um, blue collar workers. And he said the one thing that he did notice, no matter what their income level, uh, that they came from was that they still wanted flexibility in their lives. So that wasn't different. That they, and that was a problem for them because obviously on a railroad you might work really bad hours. You might get called in midnight if there's a problem. And they found that he found it harder to attract young people because of that. So they did want to have, their, it was the work-life balance issue, that that was still very important no matter um, what their background. Yes. You mentioned that children be born in the 80s, like So going forward, is that going to be a net problem with the economy, with innovation, or are they going to be a positive thing? I don't know. I think. I think that I don't know from a standpoint of innovation um, that it will be a problem. I mean, I got the sense that these were, that young people were very obviously technologically savvy, creative in a lot of ways, and could be entrepreneurial. Um, 
But I think your point is well taken that it could be it could be a problem in terms of leadership. It could be a problem in terms of taking chances, being risk takers. Um, so I do see that. I, I definitely see that. Um, that I, there was a feeling uh, a lot of people expressed to me that the millennials they interact with, they don't want to make mistakes. In other words, they're in terms of like say picking a job. They're, they sometimes are very indecisive. They have several offers because they don't want to make the wrong decision. Uh, and if they then once they get on that job, this is another reason for the job hopping, and they're not happy pretty early on. They want to try another job that you know will satisfy them. But I think they don't like to take big risks if they can avoid it, uh, and that could be an issue certainly for innovation. Yeah. So where does this uh, generation measure up um, as far as their financial responsibility? Did you do much research on like if they're, I know there was a documentary that came out last year or the year before called Maxed Out. I was just talking about all, a lot of Americans have credit card debt and what have you. And I was wondering how financially responsible this generation was if you came across that kind of information. Well, I don't know about their debt level. I, I think they do come out of college, unfortunately, with pretty heavy debt load, whether they're, especially if they go on to graduate school. Uh, so that, that is an issue, and that's one of the reasons I think they seek some of these higher-paying jobs. Uh, I don't think that's irresponsible, though. It's just a fact of life. Um, one thing that I, a lot of the young people I interviewed, they seemed very knowledgeable about retirement plans and that sort of thing, and they were very concerned about it. So I thought that was a positive sign, and I think this probably came from what they witnessed, uh, not, not right now, but uh, with their parents perhaps losing jobs, losing pensions, that sort of thing, because there was a lot of talk of that, you know, in terms of the loyalty issue that, oh, my dad or my aunt worked for this company for 25 years, and then they got, uh, they lost their job, they, they lost their pension, that sort of thing. And they really, you know, were in bad shape. And so I got this feeling that a lot of these young people had seen somebody in their family have a bad financial experience. So that maybe, uh, again, I can't say for sure, but maybe there will be more of a sense of planning for the long-term future. And, and probably what happened with the stock market last year and how it hurt most people's retirement accounts, I think that would have to have impact uh, on this generation in that regard. Um, but um, I didn't come away feeling that they were irresponsible at all financially. So um, I had a question about the job hopping uh, that you discussed. I, I actually was talking about this with some uh, friends of mine recently. And I feel like there's a perception that things have changed as far as uh, how to get ahead uh, in business, that nobody of the you know, top management in prominent businesses work their way up from the inside. Either they were on board as the 20th employee or something, um, or they were uh, coming from outside. So I, I feel like there's this perception that if you stay somewhere for a long time, you're going to wind up you know, in middle management and then get laid off at some point. Yeah, um, I think that's a very good point. And I think that does happen a lot. So, and I think the the problem I saw with this generation when I talked to them was their impatience. In other words, I think you need to spend a couple years, more than that, probably at a company to get what to, what, to get the most out of the job or the company. Um, because a lot of young people talked about their, they really thought about their career development, their career portfolio. They didn't, they didn't think about a company. There was no loyalty to the institution. If there was any loyalty, it might be to an individual manager they worked for, but that's about it. So I could buy that. And again, they often explained why. It was because they had seen companies not be loyal to their long-term employees. And I think you're right that you know the, a diversity of experience moving around does seem to be the key to moving up the ladder and being more successful uh, in your middle years. So I think they probably are doing it for some of those reasons. The only problem is, is that I just heard so many times that people would leave three months in, six months in, and I don't think they're giving some of their jobs a chance. Um, and companies are trying to deal with that, smart companies at least, by trying to show them if you stay with us, you know, you can spend three months in that department, try it out, you know, do this, do that, so that you will build your portfolio of skills here. Um, and they're not even saying, I mean, I think it's sort of the kiss of death if you, <laughs> if you went on a job interview and the uh, recruiter said, you could have lifetime employment with us. I, I don't think anybody wants to hear that. I think that probably isn't the answer. It's more just a matter of, I think, 
um, when you're at a company trying to um, develop yourself as best you can, and that may mean staying uh, a little longer. Good, thanks. I, um, I read the full Business Week article with the Universum rankings, mm -hmm. and I was really surprised to see you talk about this wake-up call in the economy, because I've been wondering, too, how they are so, sort of reacting. And I was surprised that less than 20% of current grads have jobs. But even more surprising is less than 60% have interviewed for jobs. So do you think that the other people, like, are they really like, this is a big wake-up call and they're scared? Or do you think that the millennials just think, oh, it's going to pass, let me just buy a couple years in grad school or go travel or something? Well, I think, I think they're scared. Uh, I really do. And I think that some are going back to grad school, which isn't a bad idea. I yeah. mean, let's hope in two years or however long uh, they are in school that things will be better. There's no guarantee of that. I mean, I did it when I back, um, I guess this was after 2001 when the economy uh, went down after September 11th uh, and all the other issues in the economy at that time. Um, and jobs were scarce, a lot of people went back to business school. Business schools like Harvard got record applications mm -hmm. at those in 2002, around that time. And then they came out um, a couple years later and the economy was better, but the job market wasn't that great. And I know some people regretted that they had gone back. So there's no guarantee that going back to school is the answer, but I think more are doing that. As for, um, I mean, I would say the fact that a lot didn't get interviews is just that there aren't that many people out there hiring. Right oh, there. so it was less about their willingness to interview or desire for a job and just more about companies not that going. That would be my sense yeah. of it. Um, yeah, that they're just not that, there's just not that much hiring going on yet. Um, I, it was interesting, I've tried to ask people when I run into them uh, uh, who might be in a position to know how millennials are reacting to the economy. And I get different stories. I was on an airplane with a lawyer who has, works at a firm uh, in New Jersey, and I said, so are your young associates, are they really working harder? Are they really taking the fact that they have a job at your firm seriously and valuing it? And he said, not really. He said, a lot of them, their attitude is, I'm going to work, but I'm not going to kill myself because I'm probably going to lose my job anyway. So they have more of a fatalistic view at that point. On the other hand, I was speaking to a government agency down in Washington, and one of the women in the audience, she was talking about her daughter, who had gotten a who had worked at a company last summer, and the company invited her back for this summer. And she was sort of like, oh, you know, first of all, I wasn't crazy about it, but also I want a different experience. So she wavered, but, but this was in, I think, March. She finally decided, yes, I better take that job. You know, it's better to have a job than that. Also, she called back and said, yes, I'd be happy to come back this summer. So she obviously was taking a more sensible approach, I think, uh, right. in this economy. Um, so um, I'm not sure, um, but I think that uh, I think that it's gonna. That's why I say I think it's a big wake-up call. I think that you know a lot of young people when they started college, they were seeing people with multiple job offers, and um, it's just uh, it's just not that way right now. Okay. Thank you. I know we're really short on time, so I'll be quick. Um, it, what struck me about your presentation, and I have obviously haven't read the book yet, is that you know, um, work-life balance and flexibility are important, but there's no mention in any of the slides, at least, about future family plans for any of these, or I guess we millennials. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if that came up in any of your interviews, or if that was just something that wasn't even on the radar. It seemed not to be on the radar, and I think that this generation, um, many of whom do go back home even before the economy got so bad, went back home after college. Um, they're delaying adult, some of the milestones of adulthood. Um, I think this generation is probably going to get married later and have kids later and buy houses later, not because of the economy again, but just because it's, the, you know, their, their, their way, the way they view life, that uh, they are focused more on their careers. Um, and I didn't get the sense that anybody was rushing to get married or have kids right away of the, of the millennials I interviewed who were mostly 22, 26 in that range. Um, so I, I guess it didn't really come up as a big issue how that would fit in. I mean, certainly when we talked about work-life balance, especially the women I interviewed, that was, they, some, of them, some of them who were, seemed to be pretty ambitious, hardworking women, young women, they didn't seem concerned about it right now, that they were willing to put in the hours no matter. 
Um, but they did say that's going to become more important to me when I have a family. So they talked about it, but it was sort of off in the distance. It wasn't something they were focusing on right now much. It seems like some of the solutions to uh, working with millennials and in, in companies are sort of per self perpetuating the cycle. You know, in order to retain employees, uh, provide the the flexibility and the opportunities to do Teach for America and stuff like that. So, with this being sort of a self perpetuating cycle, what do you see as the next evolution? You know, the next generational evolution, or do you think this is just the new norm? I, I it's hard to predict the next generation um, who are just small children for the most part. Um, I, I, it'll, I guess a lot will depend on how this generation is as parents. Um, I, I mean, on the one hand, you could say that because they have like, they still seem very connected and like their parents, that they'll be that way with their own children. Um, on the other hand, some may wake up and realize that I wish I had been given more independence um, and that you know I were a little more of a risk taker. Uh, and my parents hadn't been as involved in my life, uh, so they maybe they will be less, less helicopterish, if you will. Um, I don't know. It's hard. I think it's very hard to predict that this early on. Um, I, I certainly think that this new generation, um, which hasn't really been named yet, there's some names out there like Generation Z, Generation Z, uh, the the new millennials, that sort of thing. I've read names like that for this, the people who were born uh, since 2001. Um, I, I would think this economy, uh, even though their children might affect them, uh, how it will exactly, would I, I can't say, but I think that they're probably seeing some of this uh, in their own families, um, whether it's just cutting back or seeing jobs lost and houses foreclosed on whatever. Um, so they might be... Um, in some ways, a more fearful, cautious generation uh, because of that. Because that was one thing about millennials. Um, they hadn't really seen any major economic upheaval. I mean, there were some smaller recessions along the way, but um, this, at least in their adulthood, this was, you know, the first, and what a cataclysm it was, uh, but the first really uh, economic shakeup they experienced. Um, but as adults, one might be able to deal with it in a different way or a better way than if you're a child um, where, you know, it could be much scarier. So I think this, this what we're in right now could, uh, could shape that generation. Any more questions? Well, again, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.